Welcome back to DC News Now's Honoring Black History, Changing the Narrative. I'm Corey James. DC Police Chief Pamela Smith made history last year when she became the first black woman to lead the department. However, Smith has been making history for years. Our political and government reporter Leonard and Fleming sat down with her to learn more about her journey to be the top cop. I certainly didn't see the path of becoming the first African-American chief in the agency's 230-year history. Pamela Smith spoke about her appointment in 2021 as the United States Park Service's first African-American female police chief. A few big city police chief mentors were always encouraging her to dream. And it's not necessarily about the fact that I'm an African-American woman who's made it this far. A woman who grew up in Pine Bluff, Arkansas, with a single mother addicted to alcohol, wasn't done making history. One year after she retired from the Park Police and joined the Metropolitan Police Department as his chief equity officer, another opportunity arose. Then Chief Robert Conte was retiring. Smith applied. I didn't call anyone. You? No, I prayed. I prayed and I said um, to the Lord, because I'm a believer in, in the Lord, if this is what you want me to do, when I wake up tomorrow, allow this to be D.C. Mayor Muriel Bowser made her the first black female chief in history last year. The historic nature of her rise in law enforcement never dawned on her until after she achieved it, she says. I think it had everything to do that I was prepared for the job. And again, I'm not thinking about history until somebody told me that, hey, you know, you're the first. I didn't know it until somebody said it. Law enforcement seemed an unlikely career for Smith. She had family members locked up. She went into the foster care system at 13. Growing up was really tough for us. We were kind of raising ourselves. But a pastor's family adopted her, and she began to flourish, running track in high school and college and majoring in education. But police work kept calling. A park police official on a horse in New York recruited her to join. She spent 24 years in a variety of posts from San Francisco to Atlanta. Now she has a tall order in D.C. with rising crime. I'm, I still have the same passion and desire to, to help people, even as I sit as a chief of police in the nation's capital. I believe the best is yet to come for me. And still ahead on DC News Now's Honoring Black History, Changing the Narrative, Breaking Barriers. We're going to show you the first black-owned brewing company in Prince George's County coming up after the break. Welcome back. Youth crime continues to plague many parts of the DMV, and those convicted sometimes find it difficult to re-enter society after completing their sentence. But DC News Now's Dave Laval tells us how a local foundation is helping at-risk youth get a second chance at life. Castro Pierce spent time in jail as a juvenile. It was a firearm charge. The now 19-year-old turned to Jacob's Ladder in 2021 to change his life. Without that type of guidance, I probably would have been in the same situation I was already in. Jacob's Ladder is the Fort Washington-based organization created to help youth around Prince George's County with a heavy emphasis on at-risk juveniles. We were just seeing the, the same common denominators from the, the victims and, and suspects of of, of juveniles. Gerald Jordan launched Jacob's Ladder in 2016. The retired Prince George's County police officer created the organization to help primarily at-risk youth from returning to the juvenile justice system. It's real tough, especially when you're from the same area, the same county, the same locations as these crimes occur. So it's, it, it almost becomes personal. Jacob's Ladder started with basic after-school programs. It's now evolved past that. Jacob's Ladder changed its tune slightly last August with the addition of this music room. Other rooms are set aside for audio production, computer lab, and other uses. Part of the new home for Jacob's Ladder since last summer and its expanded programs. The Army flies the Apache helicopter. Jacob's Ladder put juveniles in control of it in a simulator at Fort Liberty, North Carolina. It's challenging. Captain Matthew Manning runs the Junior Flight Training Academy at Jacob's Ladder. The D.C. native is currently assigned to the Pentagon and got the aviation program off the ground last summer. You come from this type of area um, and you see the lack of representation in the current job that I have. 
What Mr. Jordan is doing, the opportunities that he's providing to the youth and to the community is second to none. That's ultimately what we hope to do is to give them um, an avenue to becoming a pilot. Jacob's Ladder operates on an annual budget of around half a million dollars. A large portion of the funding comes from the county, while private donations make up the rest. The investment, says Jordan, is priceless. Seeing the, the, the youth that come to our programs uh, succeed. Jacob's Ladder has already worked with at least 1,000 people and wants to help more at-risk youth reach their full potential. In Fort Washington, Dave Laval, DC News Now. Now we introduce you to an Alexandria man using artwork to help impoverished communities across the world. DC News Now, Liberty Zabala tells us how he finds the most beautiful art in the most unlikely places. Gabriel Williams's home in Alexandria is basically an art gallery, an ode to his travels all over the world. I've been an artist my entire life. Through my travels, I noticed that I had a responsibility because I was able to see people who lived in poverty and abject conditions much different than what we're experiencing here in America. His home also serves as storage for supplies for his nonprofit dedicated to helping impoverished communities far, far away. As a refugee, actually, that's something that actually facing us. We're a lot of frustration and some are a lot of stress. Gabriel's first project was in Kenya, where he delivered art supplies and held art workshops for refugees fleeing war. These are people who literally had to run through the bush to escape gunfire. People who've lost their mother and father in front of their eyes, but still are standing up on their own two feet. The artwork he would later sell to raise funds for the refugees. I feel like the best art sometimes comes out of dark places. His next project was in Thailand, where he used art to help exploited and abused children heal. Our aim and our goal of that exercise was to do was allow kids to be kids and allow them to also have a means to express themselves, express how they feel and put a mask uh, where they can smile and be happy because a lot of them are carrying the weight of their trauma. Another project led him to Tanzania, where he met villagers without access to clean water. There were no water to drink. Even the children getting malnutrition because there were no water to, for them to drink or for cooking. The problem was that in order for them to get water, the women would have to walk at least 10 miles going and 10 miles coming back. So that's anywhere between 15 to 20 miles just for one trip of water. So Paint the Globe Foundation built a system to provide clean water to a village of 5,000. Our greetings to the Painting Global Foundation workers. The friends of the United States who donated for us to get this water. You, Mr. Gabriel, and we really, really, really pray for the Global Foundation for what they did for us. We have a responsibility to provide resources to them, to provide them opportunity, and whatever is in our capacity to make a difference. He is constantly gathering art supplies and donations for his next global project. He is now working to get financial support to build a visionary art center in Rwanda, continuing his mission to use art to help change the world. We do have the ability to touch people here and far. So we're literally painting the globe metaphorically and literally. Liberty Zabala, DC News Now. From humble beginnings to DC's chief of police, up next we go one-on-one -on -one with the first black woman to lead the police force in the nation's capital. Welcome back to DC News Now's Honoring Black History, Changing the Narrative. I'm Corey James. DC Police Chief Pamela Smith made history last year when she became the first black woman to lead the department. However, Smith has been making history for years. Our political and government reporter Leonard and Fleming sat down with her to learn more about her journey to be the top cop. I certainly didn't see the path of becoming the first African-American chief in the agency's 230-year history. Pamela Smith spoke about her appointment in 2021 as the United States Park Service's first African-American female police chief. A few big city police chief mentors were always encouraging her to dream. And it's not necessarily about the fact that I'm an 
African-American woman who's made it this far. A woman who grew up in Pine Bluff, Arkansas, with a single mother addicted to alcohol, wasn't done making history. One year after she retired from the Park Police and joined the Metropolitan Police Department as his chief equity officer, another opportunity arose. Then Chief Robert Conte was retiring. Smith applied. I didn't call anyone. Really? No, I prayed. I prayed and I said um, to the Lord, because I'm a believer in, in the Lord, if this is what you want me to do, when I wake up tomorrow, allow this to be. D.C. Mayor Muriel Bowser made her the first black female chief in history last year. The historic nature of her rise in law enforcement never dawned on her until after she achieved it, she says. I think it had everything to do that I was prepared for the job. And again, I'm not thinking about history until somebody told me that, hey, you know, you're the first. I didn't know it until somebody said it. Law enforcement seemed an unlikely career for Smith. She had family members locked up. She went into the foster care system at 13. Growing up was really tough for us. We were kind of raising ourselves. But a pastor's family adopted her, and she began to flourish, running track in high school and college and majoring in education. But police work kept calling. A park police official on a horse in New York recruited her to join. She spent 24 years in a variety of posts from San Francisco to Atlanta. Now she has a tall order in D.C. with rising crime. I'm, I still have the same passion and desire to, to help people, even as I sit as a chief of police in the nation's capital. I believe the best is yet to come for me. And still ahead on D.C. News Now's Honoring Black History, Changing the Narrative, Breaking Barriers. We're going to show you the first black-owned brewing company in Prince George's County coming up after the break. Welcome back. A Maryland brewery is making strides as the first black owned brewing company in Prince George's County. Now it is among the 1% of black owned breweries in the industry. DC News Now's John Marie Sasse spoke with the husband and wife co-owners on how they are breaking beer barriers. We want to intrude on a market that's underrepresentative of African Americans. It's the first black owned brewing company in Prince George's County. Her being, you know, one of 12 African American women in the country to own a brewery is truly legendary stuff. Husband and wife Jasmine and Andrew Dill are co-owners of Liquid Intrusion Brewing Company. The Maryland couple started back in 2020 after Andrew lost his job working for a popular beer brand. So hobby of mine, always knew how to talk about beer, drink it, sell it, just didn't really know how to brew it. Um, had a lot of free time during the pandemic, so why not? It seemed like a dream come true when they were gifted their very own home brew set up by the family of a Prince George's County man after he passed. She practically said, hey, you remind me so much of my husband. Um, his dream was to be Prince George's County's first black owned brewery. Take all of his equipment for free. I know that you will take care of it. It will be a blessing in, in disguise, so almost like a divine type thing. And um, we took it, brought it, all of his equipment back to life, and we are now where we are today. Through trial and error, they were able to launch many flavors like the South of DC Cream Ale. It's a long lost style. It's vegan friendly as well, too. And the African Queen and her Seven Seas IPA. What if you just want another all day drinking beer with a little bit uh, more oomph to it? That would yeah. be our IPA. They're also working on new flavors called Lemongrass and Plum Basic Farmhouse. And we've been able to convert a lot of our uh, wine drinkers over. Flavor definitely has customers wanting more and their unique design on the can makes people feel at home. We literally put Maryland on the on <laughs> map. We put a little uh, lotus of where we want to be located in southern Prince George's County, and then it shows the whole DMV on a can. Of course, with the south of D.C. Der derived from the name because we want we are 30 minutes south of D.C., and um, we just want to target our southern Maryland beer drinkers as well. So far, they've partnered with BWI Airport to sell their products and also certain Whole Foods in D.C. and Total Wines in Maryland. And they didn't stop there. They also work with several black-owned bars across the DMV. We get to choose which account that we feel is the best fit for us that will represent us in a positive light um, and make sure that they're not doing anything to deter and or tear down our community. Jasmine and Andrew say they're hoping to open up their very own location in the southern part of Prince George's County soon, which would make them the first black owned brick and mortar in that area. We want us to make sure that our community, our county, our towns are connected and we could be a, a beacon of light that people can come to to kind of voice their opinions. And one of their goals, to put an end to stereotypes. 
that black people do not drink beer. Just trying to make sure we can continue to educate our community and letting them know that there is quality liquid for them to drink. We're just trying to change that mold by one beer at a time to each and every one of our consumers. While also building on their passion and bringing people together. It doesn't matter who you are, where you're from, your orientation, your background, it's all about the liquid. And if we stay true to that, may the liquid always prevail. All right, that was our Yamarisa Say reporting. Now, a push to help black students feel seen and heard at Hagerstown High School several years ago is now taking on a life of its own. DC News Now, Skylar Salas has more on the club that's been passed on to the next generation of scholars who are hoping to continue the legacy of work. North Hagerstown High School is known for its diversity of students, but how much would it surprise you to know out of all the different cultures, there wasn't an organization made for black students until some students made it their mission to create one. Wanted to create BSU is because we were kind of the only black students in um, higher classes, whether it was AP or IB, and we felt like very singled out in our classes. Sheriff and a few of her classmates created the school's first black student union back in 2019. For them, the club would be a way for students to share similar experiences inside and outside of school. But in its early stages, it did have some pushback. We noticed that there was a lot of pushback from people who were not black. And it was kind of very hurtful because all we were doing was trying to create a space that was celebrating and uplifting black voices, especially in spaces where we were, our voices weren't being heard, our concerns weren't being met, and we couldn't fully be ourselves. But through all the pushback for the establishment of the club, students were able to create the club. It just means that now the next generation of students have a place that they can be themselves and they can talk about the issues that they're facing and not feel like they have to make themselves smaller to fit in because they don't have anywhere to go or have anyone to talk to about the unique experiences that they are facing being students here. Now, years later from the club's creation, the Black Student Union is still thriving with a new generation of leaders dedicated to carrying on the legacy of the founding members. Very honored to be passed down this role. Currently, the Black Student Union is carrying the legacy left by their founders while also making it their own. First meeting, they told me, this is what we want to do, Ms. McCoy. This is how we're going to do it. For me, the most attractive thing about BSU was the discussion that we that we held and how intellectual, but also insightful in how different people think. And so what I'm trying to do uh, is trying to find a way to make the discussion a bit more engaging, have a more interactive with the members and their opinions of the entire uh, of the entire group. Whenever you come in, you know everybody's always asking like, what's your name? You feel like it's a family, and that's something I wanted to ensure that we could have this year as well. According to regular members of the club, the way they have steered the club has had a positive effect on members. I feel like it's really like opened my mind to wanting to learn new things about different cultures and different people's backgrounds. It's really just made me more open-minded. Growing up in elementary school when I moved here back in 2016, people would make fun of me about my certain features, you know, how my nose is a little more bigger than the average nose, you know, my lips are a little bigger, just little things that made me insecure about being black, and then I like hated like you know being black but ever since I joined BSU the more I was able to feel comfortable in my own skin. Reporting in Hagerstown, Maryland, Skylar Salas for DC News Now. Coming up, a Virginia teen develops a cancer-fighting soap. How the local student's invention could make a difference in treatment. You're watching DC News Now's Honoring Black History. A Virginia middle school student has been named America's top young scientist after developing a bar of soap that could be useful in treating skin cancer. DC News Now's Max Marcilla introduces us to the 14 year old whose invention might help those fighting melanoma. Inside Woodson High in Fairfax County is, if experts are correct, America's next top scientist studying his craft. Meet 14-year-old Heyman Bekele. Late last year, Bekele won $25,000 and the honor from 3M and Discovery Education. He took a thought he often had since living in Ethiopia as a kid and turned it into a potentially world-changing idea. I was there until I was four years old and I saw so many people working really long hours under the hot sun. 
and that develops problems like skin cancer. That idea? Let's let him tell it. Just some sodium hydroxide in a soap base. And then comes the actual cancer-fighting ingredients, this drug called, and it's a mouthful, but imidazoquinoline, incorporating a lipid-based nanoparticle into the solution. And I know that, again, it sounds a little bit of a mouthful, but it's actually pretty simple when you think about it. Spoken less like a 14-year-old and more like a true scientist. Here's what that boils down to. The soap would include elements of other skin cancer treatments like creams or ointments, but is both way more accessible and affordable because it's soap. And that lipid-based nanoparticle, that helps make sure the treatment doesn't wash off when you rinse off in the shower. We see it day in and day out. Dermatologist no, Andrew no, Pabby no. says it's a major problem, especially in underserved populations. The issue is that they're dying unnecessarily or having morbidity and mortality unnecessarily because they just don't have the same access to care that we're fortunate to have here. That's why Bekele decided a soap was the best option to fight a disease he saw too often growing up. To think that this will have a real world impact, not just in Ethiopia, but all around the world, you know? And that's what really stayed in my brain throughout the entire process. This Black History Month, Bekele is working to become one of the countless black scientists who has changed the world. He first has to go through clinical trials and FDA certification, but wants the soap to eventually turn from a passion project to a nonprofit organization to help provide equitable and accessible access to skin cancer treatment around the world. For so long, everybody's just been put especially when it comes to uh, people of like African-American culture, it's just been put in a box. And it's really great to see that everything is sort of, that box is slowly being broken and everyone's being told that they can achieve their dreams. In Fairfax County, Max Marcella, DC News Now. Empowering generations, how two Maryland teens are engaging their classmates to take interest in the legal system. Welcome back. Despite not having law degrees, two Maryland high school students are using their love for law to inspire others. I had the chance to sit down with Omari Barnes and Nazir Scott. Both co-founded the organization's Barnes and Scott Youth Law Camp to bring together teens who, like them, are passionate about the legal system. Uh, talking first, what made you guys start this organization, this group, and when did it all come into play? Great. So um, we had an art teacher, um, Mr. Coleman, shout out to him. Um, and he connected the two of us with each other. Um, he said, hey, Omari, I see you have an interest in law. Um, why don't you start an organization that supports youth interested in pursuing careers in law and public policy, for example? Um, and he um, connected the two of us. We put our two heads together. Um, we stayed dedicated, put in the work. And here we are um, with Barnes and Scott Youth Law Camp, an incredible organization meant to help the youth in our community. And Azir, for folks who don't know, how does this camp work? What does it do for students who get involved and, and want to have a career in law? Yeah, it gives students um, career focused um, educational modules, conferences, and speaker events where they're able to have a focus in public policy, politics, law, and civics. And also gives them a network to you know, farther their career in the future. And why is it so important for students to get this sort of experience early on when it comes to perhaps having any interest in the legal system, being an attorney, or just having an overall concept of what it's like? Um, because we know here at Barnes and Scott that um, knowledge, legal knowledge, is not regulated to the courtroom, but it also empowers you to become a civically engaged citizen in the future. Um, so that's really important in this time for our youth um, we also want to make sure that they realize that they are valued and that there are like-minded people in those fields of work as well. Before I met Nasir Scott, I thought I was the only one that was interested <laughs> in law. But I realized that um, when you come together with like-minded individuals, you can really do what's best for a community. And that's what we've done here with Barnes and Scott Youth Law Camp. Okay. According to the American Bar Association, the number of black people entering the legal system as attorneys is declining. Mm -hmm. The number of minorities who are Hispanics, women, um, Asian Americans, that is growing. Is that concerning to hear that the number of blacks is declining? And if so, why is that? Yeah, um, I think it's concerning because I believe it starts now when you're in high school and middle school. 
Um, I hear a lot of students say, I want to be a lawyer, but I don't think they know the path that it takes. And I think if we provide a curriculum, a program, classes that prepare them now for the rigorous um, courses that they have to take when they go on the pre-law track and go to law school, I think it would kind of empower them to want to go into the law field. If we started now um, focusing on that career field. And do you have a lot of young black students who are getting involved? Yes, we do. Definitely in the county, we do. So we're proud to say that. How many would you say if you had an estimate? Yes, we had a conference last Saturday. We had about 40 students, a majority being um, African American and black. So that was really happy to see that. And they all come from Prince George's County. How does that make you feel? I mean, it just makes me feel really good just knowing that this organization just started eight months ago and we were able to kind of reach that many people. Um, and also hearing them come to me after the conference saying, hey, I'm now interested in a career in law. And that makes me feel like this is benefiting somebody and it's important in the community. People who often start organizations, they have pits and peaks when it comes to it. What have been some of the challenges that you face and what have been some of the joys that you've experienced in doing it? Um, well, um, in terms of joys, um, I've met amazing individuals, one of which, of course, being Nasir Scott himself. Um, I've also had the opportunity to network um, with legislators and stakeholders in the community um, whom other, otherwise I would never have been able to network with um, because youth, they're important. They're our future. But people forget that they're also our present as well. Perfect. Nazir, we got about 30 seconds left. You're 18. What do you want to be when you grow old? get older? Yes, I want to be a prosecutor and then end my career off as a governor of Maryland. Okay. And Omari, what do you want to be when you get older? You're only 16. Yes, <laughs> but I'm going for the big one. Um, so so let's, say, um, let's say a legislator um, and maybe one day president of the United States. Maybe right. just one day. All right. Two smart, intelligent black men. I think you both can do it. Thank you both for Thank being you. here. Thank you. And still ahead on DC News Now's Honoring Black History, Changing the Narrative, and HBCU and the DMV entering the figure skating world, why the university is planning to change the face of a sport that has very few people of color. Welcome back. I'm Corey James. According to U.S. Figure Skating, only 2% of figure skating fans are black. And here in the district, a group of Howard University students are trying to change that and create interest in the sport. DC News Now sports reporter Alex Flum has more on the first ever HBCU figure skating team. For Maya James. Cheyenne Walker figure skating is more than just a hobby. My earliest memory on the ice um, would be when I turned eight years old. We had a skating show and I remember skating. I fell, but I got right back up and I cheesed and my parents have a video of me just waving at the camera. So that's my first very vivid memory of me on the ice. Five or six years old, uh, my mom took me to an ice show at our local rink and I saw people that looked like me skating and I was like, I think I can do that. Both Walker and James are students at Howard University. When they first got on campus, there wasn't a figure skating team to join. My freshman, sophomore year, um, I started to do a little bit of research, kind of searching up like Howard and figure skating. Nothing really popped up. And I was saying how I really wish that we would have continued to do skating or figured out a way to do a club. I did see an article by U.S. Figure Skating and I was reading it out and I saw that Cheyenne's name popped up. So, and I don't usually check my DMs, but I just was scrolling through my DMs and I was like, wait. And I was like, hey, I'm starting this club. Do you wanna, you know, get in on it? This girl is saying that she found me and I was, and I messaged her immediately and I was like, send me your number. I kind of just knew it was a sign, like a sign from God. Their connection led to the creation of Howard's club figure skating team, the first ever at an HBCU, holding their first practice this past October. The first moment on the ice, I actually um, teared up just a little bit because of what it took to get there. Despite growing up skating, Walker and James both say it's rare to see black figure skaters at the highest levels of the sport. You can be the change that you want to see in this space and know that you're always going to have people, even if you don't hear it, there's silent pe there's people in the back applauding you and lifting you up and that you have a support system here at Howard. I honestly want to see more HBCUs and, you know, diverse institutions have collegiate skating clubs as well, but also just be that representation for, you know, the little brown kids, you know. 
I just say keep going. Um, you belong here. With more than 30 skaters on the current team, the Bison duo and the students they've inspired to join hope the program will last many more years. It's amazing. Like this is history. And like we're the first black team to do anything like this. And initially I had gone into college thinking, okay, I'm gonna retire my skates. You know, there's no other figure skaters. Junior Gabrielle Francis is one of the skaters that's helped make the team become a reality, magnifying James and Walker's message. If you're thinking about being a figure skater and you don't typically look like the normal figure skater, you're not white, you're not petite, you know, here I am, a black plus size figure skater, and I'm going out there and I want to make history, I want to encourage other people and I want people to feel as though you know what I can do that too. I may not look like what the normal quote unquote figure skater looks like but I'm about to change the face of figure skating we're just putting our foot in the door so hopefully other people will say oh you know what we should try this too and then you know it won't be like as lonely reporting at the Herbert Wells ice rink in College Park Maryland Alex Fulman DC News Now a program in Prince William County is helping young men of color realize their full potential. DC News Now's Haley Mylon spoke with the organizer who is using his former career in computer science to steer young kings into leaders of the world. I would like to go into engineering because I would like to do something with my hands. I want to go into biochemistry or software engineering. I want to go into data analytics or something in statistics. My career goal is to uh, get into cybersecurity as like a network engineer. Big dreams and bright futures. For the young men in the Future Kings program, the sky's the limit. So if they could see a, a successful career person, that maybe they'd want to be a successful career person. When Eric King left his software engineering career, he knew he wanted to give young men of color the chance to build strong careers and great lives. The nonprofit gives boys in grades 6 through 12 the chance to get hands-on in fields such as science, technology, engineering, and math. Our program services boys who are labeled special needs during the school day, as well as boys who are labeled as talented and gifted in the program. And when you see them working on a project together, you can't tell who is special needs and who is advanced. Playing to students' strengths in a number of ways, bringing out the best in each of them. Programs include cybersecurity, game design, biomedical sciences, and engineering. Each one of them offering incredible opportunities to work in professional lab settings. We do many different things inside the lab, like pipetting, running gels, electrophoresis, PCR, just many things that if I wasn't a Future Kings, I wouldn't have been able to, like, I seriously have, wouldn't have even heard of the terms. Those experiences open up more doors. Joshua Tamaklo is an alum of the program. While his little brother George is still in high school, Joshua is now at the University of Pittsburgh filled with gratitude for future kinks. That exposure has allowed me to get a research opportunity at Pittsburgh with UPMC, so I'm very grateful to the Future Kings program. The program produces all kinds of students and professionals. We have students who uh, have gone to Yale in, uh, in uh, neurosciences, and we have students who go to uh, Norfolk State and Virginia State and Hampton uh, as HBCUs. But then we also have guys who went into the workforce, and we have guys who go directly into the military. No matter what a future king does career-wise, the goal is the same. We want you to be ready to be lifelong learners, and we want to use your time in future kings as a way to prepare you for life after high school. In Prince William County, I'm Haley Mylon, DC News Now. All right, coming up, making history in the DMV, the first black quarterback to play in the Super Bowl and win it shares his story, how he rose from the underdog to MVP. Welcome back. We're highlighting a black quarterback who not only broke records in the Super Bowl more than 30 years ago, but also made history. DC News Now's Leonard and Fleming sat down with a local legend in Virginia. It was a game certainly that I remember watching on television. Will Williams came in as the big underdog, but he proved not only could he handle the quarterback role that had been elusive for many black men before him, but he thrived and made special history. 
So I understood what the impact was to black America. There's no doubt in my mind. Doug Williams made history on January 31st, 1988 in San Diego when he became the first black quarterback to start and win a Super Bowl, a game on the world stage against the favored Denver Broncos. Stood the impact of, of, of the black Americans and, uh, and even, even some white folks in America, you know, they, they was pulling for me too. And it wasn't his first time making history. He was also the first black quarterback chosen in the first round of the NFL draft by the Tampa Bay Buccaneers in 1978. I never thought any other quarterback from a mental standpoint, from a physical standpoint, was better than me. And he proved it, taking the Bucs to the NFC Championship game in 1979. But a contract dispute caused him to sit out the 1983 season. And then in 1986, Washington under legendary coach Joe Gibbs, who was Williams' offensive coordinator in Tampa, came calling. And in 1987, he was named the starter for the playoffs that led to the Super Bowl. He says the day before the big game, he felt tremendous pain. You know, I woke up with, with a toothache. He had to undergo a four and a half hour root canal. He didn't want to miss his lucky bag of Hershey Kisses. Now I stayed up most of the night and I found a way. And in the second quarter of the game, Williams exploded. Boom, one touchdown. Boom, two touchdowns. Boom, three touchdowns. Williams was named Super Bowl MVP and the first black quarterback to hold that trophy. And to this day, people still vividly remember number 17's actions that day. It's kind of like to them, uh, Barack Obama getting elected president, Jackie Robinson playing baseball. William says he mentors black quarterbacks and his phone is always open to them. And that includes Kansas City Chiefs star quarterback Patrick Mahomes, who is playing in Sunday's game. And black quarterbacks in the league are ones he roots for because like him, they are often the underdog. Leonard N. Fleming, DC News Now. And our final story taking us across the world and back to the DMV, a woman sharing how a college invite for her husband moved them from Africa to Maryland. DC News Now, Stephen Cohen tells us how she took a passion from her native land to seed a garden in her new home. When Tanya Spandla arrived in Maryland from Zimbabwe, she took a liking to the farmland here in Montgomery County. Not only growing the very freshest organic produce to market, but to generously share with the food insecure. Does food pantry distribution uh, every week to uh, underserved communities uh, in the DMV area. While also sharing her proud heritage with locals. During the pandemic, Spandla had anxiety about food insecurity in the community. She partnered with the Mana Food Bank, networking with more than 350 nonprofits and volunteers, committing more than 33,500 hours to combat hunger and food insecurity. The food bank distributes 12,000 pounds of food daily, serving more than 50,000 people each year. It reminds us of um, back home uh, in Zimbabwe where we grew up. This is what we ate every single day, corn um, and vegetables. That's a, a whole meal for us. The four acres tiny farms were once a slave plantation dating back to 1780. And it turns out that one of the families enslaved on that farm happens to be ancestors to John King, who served as Secretary of Education in the administration of President Barack Obama. And landowner Amanda Mosco hopes Tanya's venture can be a model for neighbors. Land is being developed all over the place, so we need to remember the past and, and save it. Meanwhile, Tanya is promoting ownership of farmland here by those with her life experience. Try and gather mostly uh, black farmers, immigrant farmers who are um, who have these challenges. Spandla is concerned that the average age of a Montgomery County farmer is 58, approaching retirement age, which is why she is passionate about recruiting new young farmers, exposing them to gardening and agriculture at an early age. She wants to groom them for thriving careers, growing nutritious, healthy crops that can be shared by an appreciative community. And Spandla hopes to expand her enterprise by thinking locally, acting globally. Reporting from Gaithersburg for Black History Month, Stephen Cohen, DC News Now. And that's it for our hour-long special honoring black history, changing the narrative. If there is a story you'd like to see again, you can find it on our website, dcnewsnow.com. Just click the community tab and select honoring black history. Until next time, I'm Corey James. And again, thank you for joining us as we celebrate black history.